All right, everyone. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started so that we have um, the whole hour here. Um, we're super excited to host Miha for the second time um, back in, I guess it was early March. It feels like just yesterday and also months ago um, that we had you come do an awesome talk about art history and portraits through time. We have that recorded. So for anyone who's interested, I can send that link in the chat. We're super excited today to kind of talk about sketching. And um, for some of you, you may already be sketchers. You, it might be your first time. Um, Miha is going to be a really great guide for you know wherever your experience level is today we are recording so i can go ahead and share that um, and it'll go to the whole you youtube in about a week give us about a week we like to um, try and get the the video nice and cut up to our youtube and then i will throw in the chat one more time um, another link we're hosting mia again in may for a class on comics and then he'll be back again in june for another class on portraits so just kind of stay tuned to the whole you um, and i'll get you the links in the chat I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to you, Miha. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Anna. It looks like I'm taking over this uh, whole U channel. So, <laughs> um, welcome everybody. I'm very excited to be here, and thank you for hosting me again, Anna. It's it's a pleasure to be back. Um, now we're going to do some sketching today. So hopefully, you are ready to uh, you know learn a thing or two, or just take a break from your everyday, whatever it looks like these days. Um, so. I do acknowledge that there's a lot to learn when it comes to sketching, but it really is this one thing that you need to know, and that's you just want to have fun. You want to have a piece of paper or some sort of surface. It can really be anything. It can be an envelope. It can be anything you want. It can be a post-it. As long as you're sort of having fun doing what you're doing, that's really the key. So the way I have it um, kind of try to design this little thing for us today is we're going to look at a very briefest of histories. We're going to look at some examples. Then we're going to look at some approaches or different processes to employ. We're going to talk briefly about materials because I get that question, um, question a lot. And then we'll do some demonstrations. We'll do some exercises. And then at the end, we'll sort of review a couple of key points. So just briefly about myself. My name is Miha Sarani. I was born in Ljubljana, which is in Slovenia. Um, I'm, I'm a visual artist and an art educator by vocation. Also, um, and I'm, I'm an art historian, which is why sometimes I sort of get a little lost on the tangent of art history because I just love it. And so why do people sketch? Uh, really, there are, ver there are various reasons why people do that. But I would say the most commonly, it's because it's fun. It's a great kind of exercise to observe what you see and sort of try to make sense of it. And so, you know, back in the day when we used to have rotary phones with wire, we would like be, you know, doodling in a corner of a phone book or something while we were talking. So some people use sketching to help them organize their thoughts. It's, it's a great way to kind of help you kind of get to the, the point and really articulate your, your, your interests. And that's, uh, the other part is most commonly sketching began to kind of try to understand or interpret the world around us. It helps make sense of things, right? And then some deliberately use sketches as an idea to a larger concept. And if you want to think about what a sketch is, a sketch is like this. <laughs> That's right, sketch is like a riff. Now you can't play the whole riff throughout. It would be a very boring song unless it's Eric Clapton, but it can really help you articulate what you're interested in observing. So we've got Leonardo right here. And he's, you see, he's very, he's not intentional. He's not worried about, oh, I'm mixing a, a, a portrait with, with some you know, architectural structures because this is a sketch. He's just laying down information he's not being too precise and sometimes they can be observational and and sort of compositional too so for example you can see him overlapping imagery to kind of try to understand what his ultimate goal is which would be a clearly a painting of an adoration of child you know uh, christ by virgin mary so different artists are very deliberately using sketch to help them figure out logic of what they intend to do in composition, framing, the values, which we're going to talk about later. So if you look at this gorgeous, uh, very quick, very loose ink um, sketch by Rembrandt, you can see how closely he sticks to the 
ultimate destination, which in his case is a painting of the uh, raising of Lazarus. So, but you see that he has changed things, right? Lazarus originally was in a left bottom corner and now he's over here. Why? Because compositionally, this is a much stronger uh, permutation of it. You see the diagonal line there repeated in this diagonal line. You got the, the, the blocking of the, of the values. So it's, it's, it's a good way to kind of see what works and what doesn't work. It can be very loose. It can be very immediate or it can be really sort of, you know, several takes before you get where you want to be. So we have here Hopper's Nighthawk studies, which then become a bigger study, which ultimately becomes a painting, right? Or something like a splotch, right? Which turns into a, a bullfight, bullfight scene. Look at how loose this is, right? In, in lesser hands, these would just be spills on a piece of paper, but we can all get there. It's just how... In, uh, how sort of intentional about that sketch you wish to be. Um, so, and even to show you um, some more contemporary, sketching is still widely employed by artists to this very day. We have this beautiful sketch here by Kerry James Marshall, one of my favorite artists. And then you see him execute that in a painting, right? So he's figuring out what works, he's figuring out what doesn't work. Now, as I said, sometimes it can take a form of just doodles which you might include a little bit of color, and it may evolve into something you enjoy, you like, has an interest for you. You could even take a reference from existing works. For example, here we have Mona Lisa, and there's a little funny kind of take on it with a, a little doodle with that in mind. Even abstract doodles can sometimes become paintings, right? Even if it's a sort of, um, and here, Right? There's another sort of sketch, which, and you can see how um, not, uh, the, not worried too much. The artist not too worried about the lines, right? So the lines kind of go beyond where they need to be, and then they brought back and tightened to ultimately create the image that you want to. You can have a much more frenzied um, line, such as something like this, right? This is a depiction of a, of a quartet performing and because it's live drawing, live sketching from, from, from a scene, you don't, you know, musicians are moving really fast. So, and also materials. You can use whatever kind of materials you want. For example, these are uh, sketches I've been doing lately with coffee. So uh, it's actually, I, I sketch the coffee shape first, and then I put ink on top of that, which you can tell from the fact that the ink actually extends beyond, or the coffee extends beyond the ink. Now, let's just quickly, uh, briefly talk about materials. What can you use? You can use anything you want or you wish. Just be aware that certain materials will not react well with other mediums. So for example, if you're using newsprint paper, um, sort of uh, very generic, they used to call it rag paper or also um, a recycled paper. Great for drawing, but it's not archival. So hopefully it's not something you wish to keep for a very long time. And it's certainly not good for water. If you add anything wet onto that surface, it will basically disintegrate. So you have a choice between a Bristol board, which is smoother, softer, but may not support a ton of uh, liquid or simply use watercolor or mixed media paper. That's what I'll be using today and I'll show you in a second. Now, tools to use, you can use anything from charcoal, which then sort of breaks into, uh, no pun intended, which breaks into um, vine charcoal, which is soft charcoal or compressed charcoal, which is very uh, dense. And once you put that mark down, it's sort of very hard to remove it. You got Conte Creon, which are basically colored charcoal pencils. Uh, you can use a uh, woodless pencil, which is basically just a graphite stick. These are really beautiful if you tend to do a lot of sketching uh, where you want to shade or create um, a, a value changes. The only thing be aware of is because this is a solid piece of graphite, you don't want this ever dropping. If this drops, it will it'll be like it's made out of glass. It just breaks into a thousand pieces. Eraser, clearly you want to get a kneaded, I mean, you want to get an eraser. The best for this kind of stuff is kneaded eraser because it doesn't pick up too much of your, of your um, materials off the paper. 
but you can get all sorts of, of uh, all sorts of erasers and ink pens. Now, the one thing I would say about ink pens is particularly if you tend to use an ink pen over a graphite drawing and you wish to remove the, graph, uh, the graphite below it. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. I would recommend getting this brand, Faber. The reason I say that is because if you're using the micron pens, the micron pens tend to fade when you start to erase some of that ink. So you might wanna use something that has a little more intensity and it will help that ink stay on a page. Okay, now let's start doing some exercises. Well, I thought what we would do is we're gonna use this portrait here. And for those of you that are familiar, uh, you know, this is John Lennon. For those of you that aren't, it's John Lennon of the Beatles. So I would say that the, the first easiest way to sketch is, this always works for me. You wanna squint your eyes. And when you squint, what's gonna happen is it's really gonna get rid of all the access information that you don't see, that you don't need to see. So for example, right here in the corner of his nose, there's a mid value sh shadow. If you squint, you can't see that. All you see is the very dark darks and the light lights. So I often, when I sketch, I might just quickly, uh, you, uh, squint and see if I can sort of uh, block down those dark shapes. And it's even easier if you think of those dark shapes as not an object, a recognizable object, but rather a, an abstract shape. So when I, when I look at right here, right, this big white triangle right here, if I squint, it actually looks like an arrow going up. You see that? It looks like a tip of an arrow and like an extension of an arrow right there. So I'm gonna use that shape of an arrow to help me form that face. In other words, I literally just drew an arrow. You see that? Boom. It's like FedEx sign, but going up. So that's a, that's a good way to kind of help translate the information because you don't want to get too bogged down by the detail just yet. Now, the other step you could take is you can now begin to, if you found that main kind of object, which in this case, as I said, is an arrow, you can then see that below the arrow, you have these dark half circle shapes. So feel free to put those in on each side, but look at them really. And this one, as you see, is much more, um, the swell is much larger than it is right here. So I would definitely introduce, make sure that that's a really big line, big curve right there, right? A half circle. So. Now let's look where else we have those dark shapes. Well, from the triangle down, actually the bottom of it, well, it, it extends into this additional dark shadow. Use that. And basically just once you, you, you came down to this edge, you can just kind of cut across and see you should be kind of, uh, kind of getting like that. I mean, you don't have to, you can follow your own path. This is the, the beauty of it. You can just make it be what you want it to be. And that's, that's the thing about sketching. It's really for you. It's for, for you to enjoy and have fun with. And if it looks wh whoever you want it to look like, that's great. If it doesn't, no, no, no problem. So let's move on. We got, we have made it up, made our way to this shape we see another repeti repetition of that half circle down there. And so now we have kind of blocked in all the dark shapes. And once these shapes are laid in, if you're still squinting, you will see where now the light shapes are, which is this entire side right here. So let's see, let's uh, play with that a bit. Just continue. You want to keep moving that that 
your uh, tool, your whatever, um, whether it's pencil or pen or a marker or whatever it is that you're using, you just want to keep moving it around and see if recognizable shapes, recognizable um, objects are appearing in your on your page. So even when I start moving it around a lot, as you'll see, like I'm not very particular about, for example, saying, oh yeah, that under um, under lid really matches the other side. Right now, I'm just putting in the, 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 the definition, the lines, and then later I might worry about tightening that up a little bit. So let's see, we have now gotten to the stage and once my, my values, my darks are laid in, now I can start sort of kind of polishing and fixing those edges just a tad bit, right? So I've brought it, let's one more time share. I've brought it to kind of this stage, you can see it's just kind of like a big mass of blob or, or clay. And now I'm gonna get a little more precise. This is where observation becomes a little more intentional. Up to this point, we were just kind of putting down the shapes. Now I say, okay, let's start, pick a point. And I'll start with this eye right here, which in my case is just a big old dark void. So I'm adding, let's see, I'm gonna keep it simple. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of a whiteout um, to create some of those, um, you know, like light the, right there over the eyelid, inside those, the eyes, we got that. Um, we wanna use the, the, I'm using the white out to create this uh, reflection on his lenses. Now we got, with just a little touch up, it already kind of created that volume and space and you can take it even further, depending on how precise you wish to be with this, you can continue going. You can say, well, I wanna really kind of get a sense of that eye. So then the, the question becomes, okay, yeah, there's a, inside this round shape, you can sort of say, well, I can see where the, the, where the white lines go, where the dark lines go, which brings me to something that looks more like this. Just give me a second. Okay. And I'm still just using um, white out. And now I'm actually just using uh, a little bit of a fountain pen right here to help me create uh, thinner lines. And we get just let's see how how increasing the detail in this eye all of a sudden begins to kind of create a more precise and more um representational image but if you wish you can keep it here it's absolutely it's your sketch right sketching is really just about kind of moving that pen around and or whatever the the your tool is kind of helping you articulate what your, what your point of interest is. You may be only interested in drawing his eyes. I don't know. Um, but the other way that you could approach this, and I'm just gonna use it on the same drawing to kind of um, illustrate that for you, is as a, a, to be more gestural. And what, what you do with that is sort of so on the right hand side, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a red marker to help me um, so you can see the difference when I'm done. And so in this case, I'm moving my, my tool around much more dynamically um, and trying to separate in terms of values. So I'm going to try to separate between where the lightest shapes are, where the darkest shapes are, and then where the mid tone is, which are all these grays, right? Because that's really what helps you kind of articulate 
that object as having volume and having um, some definition. So we're using a little bit of um, mid-tone here. In this case, just dynamic lines. Okay, so just by keep adding those lines, you see it's now starting to create a sense of uh, sense of space. And that's why this side is starting to feel much more three-dimensional, for example, than this side. Okay, what I'm, um, what I'm gonna do is I, I'm gonna just keep the screen open. Um, okay, so now let's say I got another marker, a different one, let's use a yellow one here. Now the yellow marker will switch to where all the light values are, right? So for where, um, where the highlights hit the forehead, the bridge of the nose, perhaps the inside um, of his um, eyelids. So let's see. All right, we got that. So let me show you when we add the, the lighter color, in this case, yellow. Now look at that. It's starting to add even more volume to it, right? And it, it already looks like a kind of crazy abstract <laughs> portrait of John Lennon. Um, now for the, the, the dark shadows, let's use, uh, I'm just using a blue one here because it will mix nicely with the red and the yellow to give us a, a much darker tone here. So, mm -hmm. here we go. And that adding that blue has certainly helped um, uh, create some of these shapes here. Now, you can. Let's see, what I'm gonna use is, I'm gonna simply use a little bit of coffee that I had left over from this morning. And now, because this is a sketch, I'm not being too precise. I'm not being too cautious. I'm just keeping things around. And look at that, you can just kind of use that coffee to help me come up with some visual ideas. And you can really use any object you wish uh, in terms of tools. Um, I, I like to just kind of experiment because you never know when, when these uh, various tools may come in handy and, or, or create some new, even old markers when they begin to run out. So what I'll do is I'll often mark them. So I know, oh, this is a one that's kind of losing its intensity. And... Hey, Mia, can you throw up that picture of Lennon again? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I was just trying to make, uh, make sure people could see some of the- um, Absolutely, thank you. Sure, absolutely. There we go. So, and what I'll do is I'll just switch off in a second. Um, now, that's one way that we could approach it. And remember, the what, what I was doing here is just simply by squinting, I, I, I kind of looked at where the darkest darks are and where the lightest lights are, which is sort of reserving your values, right? So if you see that this you look at an object and you ask yourself, where is the darkest dark on that image? Because the darkest dark on an image may not be an absolute darkest dark, right? You could have a photo that doesn't go all the way from white to black in terms of values. It can just go from light gray 
to a much darker gray. In this case, I would say that the darkest darks, the pockets of the darkest dark would be right there in, in the center of his hair on the right hand side of his face, particularly in here and in the eyes, which means that that is your, that's one side of your spectrum. The other side is going to be, there is no white in this image. Even the lightest light, which is in his shoulders and his neck is perhaps uh, a slightly off white cream color. So now by identifying which two extremes you are using in terms of color, that's how you help uh, sketch your image by saying, oh, the lightest light is actually this, which means that comparing to the, the lightest light on my image, where does, for example, his upper lip go? Which you would say, well, it's slightly less light than, for example, his shoulder, but it's not, neither one of them are white. And that just kind of helps you um, establish the shape and it also helps you identify what it is that you want to put your focus on in terms of um, what is the significant information in, in the sketch, in an image. Um, that's, let's see, the other way we could approach this is sometimes a sketching, uh, what I'll do is I'll just use a, there's one thing I forgot to tell you earlier. If, if any of you sort of get interested in um, how, to, how the other tools to use, there's these great mechanical pens that you can sort of fill them up with lead. And I would highly recommend to use um, blue, which it, we used to be no, known as the non Xerox blue or red. And so those are great because they don't really, you can maybe see it right there. So when you, when you lay down, this is particularly if you're kind of new at this, because if you lay down a line, right? Something like that, it's not, very sort of uh, defining. You can kind of use it and play around with it a little bit. It doesn't really lock you into the image like it did when we went in with the marker. Once we added the marker, things were sort of, there was not a lot of <laughs> leeway there. But if you're using this red pencil, which is, which is great, uh, you can also get them in Prisma colors. Um, it helps you again to quickly identify. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to I'm literally, here, let me show you. I'm literally just doing this. I'm, I'm, I'm doing lines, frenzied lines to try to get as close to the shape of that head that I'm looking at. In this case, it's the head, but whatever it is that the object that you are observing, right? So just keep moving this around. And eventually what's going to happen is I'll begin to see shapes inside these lines, kind of like when you look at a wood grain, uh, you know, and, and you see pattern or we look at clouds and like, oh my God, that cloud totally looks like a bull or something. So by overlaying these lines, it's sort of, it's, a, it's, it's helping us identify within this is there, are there recognizable shapes that could serve as, you know, what eventually could look like a head of, of John Lennon. So I, let me put back the image for those of you that are following along. So let's see, I'm going to use a red marker in this case to really isolate those lines and show you what, how to get to, uh, Okay, so it's so funny when when uh, when people start squinting because they sketch because it always it always looks so. I, I can only imagine people walking down the street seeing artists squint and think, "Oh, what what is going on?" <laughs> so look at that inside those red lines, frenzied gestural lines, that they were totally recognizable 
lines, the lines that I think are close to the source that we are referring to. Now, this can be, you know, you can watch people walking down the street, you can be watching news, you could start sketching your loved ones as they're watching TV. Um, you can, as I said, you can um, refer to uh, previous masterworks and kind of, <clears throat> pardon me, um, try to see what made them great. Um, try to study them by, by analyzing them. Okay. Now, we can also, what we can do is you could actually compile it out of multiple shapes, right? You can sort of create a collage out of a variety of sketches. You could uh, say, okay, well, we got, we're kind of getting into this stage, but I'm not necessarily really particularly loving what's happening right here. So what I might do is I like the previous image, you know, the, Im the previous image kind of had something going for it. So what I'll do is I'll simply tear that page off and do something like this. Give me a sec. Look at that. And now we have an expansion on the thing ripped off the previous page, kind of lined it up because I like the top half, which I didn't care for right here, but I kind of like the bot bottom half here as well. And that's the beautiful thing about sketching because it's simply sort of, you know, you're not too worried about uh, messing up your drawing. And if you think of it as a drawing, then it sort of has some kind of finality to it. People think like, oh, I'm trying to create this drawing. It's gonna be a gift for my loved one for Valentine's Day or whatever. So people get quite rigid uh, often within their exploration. They're, they're less willing to try new exciting things when it's not termed a sketch, okay? And so because it's a sketch, you just, you can do whatever you want with it. So let's see what else we could do with it. I think there's so many things that could be doable. So let's pick up on that um, image again. And let's say, all right. You could do something like a dab of watercolor or red wine if you don't have watercolor available or if you don't have red wine available, then you could maybe even use Pepto-Bismol or, you know, any, anything goes at this point. Um, I, I've tried many of those um, things on, on, pay, on paper and sometimes it does work out quite well. Sometimes though it's a little less successful. So I'm going to add a little bit of ink. And in this case, what I'm using is just a bottle of India ink. Um, and the cool thing about ink is that you can always, you can always mix it with water and sort of dilute it, or you could keep it as saturated as you wish and really intense. And one thing I, I in case I haven't mentioned it yet, anybody can do all of this. We tend to think like some sort of rarefied practice for artists that they employ, but anybody can do everything I'm doing right now. This It's absolutely doable. And so let's see, I'm going to just use a little bit of ink. I'll show you in a second. Just gotta make sure this and <laughs> the ink doesn't run all over my computer. Um, but even the, the higher saturation of the medium, so let me show you, by adding that ink, you see, how much darker it is comparing to that marker that I used before. And therefore it feels heavier and it's starting to create more of a volume, uh, a more of a sense of three dimensionality. Now we can even get, um, let's see, we can get even more. And this is where that uh, visualizing where your values are reserving or 
uh, or blocking your values. So the darkest dark, of course, is in his eyes. So I'm gonna use that um, ink because it's so adding so much sculptural volume to it and so much kind of definition. I'm gonna do the eyes first and see what occurs. And you know, the, the reason I love to sketch is because I very rarely can anticipate what the outcome is gonna be. And very often, it, you know, with practicing artists there, they kind of get caught in a certain process which can sometimes stagnate the practice because it's like, for those of you that like music, you know, it's like the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones have established their sound. They, they don't want to mess with that. It's, it's, it's lucrative business. So artists sometimes don't want to mess with the visual language that they've helped define for themselves either. But sketching is such a good excuse because that can really help them kind of step outside of that. And I've seen, I used to, before COVID, when I would ride the light rail um, to, to, I was teaching at um, Seattle Central, I would light a light rail and that was my favorite thing to do, which is pull out the notebook and start sketching. At one point though, I had to stop because I was probably starting to look a little creepy. But anyways, look at this. Just by adding a little bit, a couple of passages of that ink, right? We are starting to kind of get a definition and a little more precision too. And the truth is that if I overlaid the original photo with this image, it would probably not line up at all. But that's okay. I, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just kind of trying to explore and have fun. And in the process of having fun, maybe discover something new to either apply to my everyday life or perhaps apply to my my everyday practice um, art practice that's that's the, the the cool thing about art really a anybody can do it it's not it shouldn't be rarefied as sort of only for those that have studied it or or have um trying to bring some of that ink shadow into the lips. And here I start to get a little less heavy with that ink, let me show you. Because by leaving certain areas uncovered, like up there in the upper lip, it sort of creates like a highlight, you know? It looks a little bit like more natural, like the light is hitting his up, upper um, lip. And therefore it just looks a little more, um, convincing more a little more um sense of realism in it okay now i'm gonna leave the let's see let's uh let's enforce with this ink while i have it this section of the head which is on the right right hand side where we have all those heavy shadows and also look at how these shadows of the hair which articulate his right hand side are actually um, darker and heavier than the background behind them. And what that does, it really helps create um, a distinction between his head and that space behind. Now that's because this is, a. I, I'm not sure who the photographer was on this photo, but that's a very common artistic trope that you have all seen happen before, and that's Rembrandt. When you think of Rembrandt, this is how he would light his, his um, subjects in paintings. Why? I'll, sh I'll tell you in a second. Let me just um, fill this in. I have the brush, and then I will t tell you why he would do that. He would do that because in art or in art making, if you wish to guide an, uh, uh, a viewer, right? I, I, I generally would say manipulate, but I'm trying not to use that language. But if an artist is trying to guide the viewer through the painting, right? Um, you, you, you want to use visual cues 
into how to move them about. So let's uh, look at one of the paintings that we've seen earlier. Uh, okay, let's, great, let's use, let's use uh, uh, Mona Lisa. So the highest contrast, meaning the biggest jump between light and dark is right, the way the face is framed by a dark strip, right? By a shadow. And that is the highest contrast because this is the lightest light in a painting. And this is arguably some of the darkest dark. So what that does is regardless of where you wish to look as a viewer, your eye is constantly gonna get drawn back here because you can't avoid seeing that contrast. It keeps, we're like moths to a flame right there. So in this case, what Rembrandt would do in his paintings is create a moment that the, the dark is next to a slightly lighter and a light is next to a slightly darker and therefore create a sense of movement and it feels very three-dimensional, right? It feels like very sculptural. It feels like you can actually feel his face stepping out of that drastic shadow. And that shadow is what in art making is called chiaro scuro, which comes from word chiaro, light and scuro meaning dark it's 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 modeling with contrast if you didn't have that this this if you didn't have that in a painting the painting would look extremely flat right if here i wasn't using the pockets of shadow this would look completely flat same thing here it's the shadows that help sell this as three-dimensional right? And shadows even in those uh, color jumps, right? Look at that. Look at the, st the difference between this sketch of Iggy Pop and then a painting of Iggy Pop. And it's those shadows that help sell it, right? They help sell it as a three-dimensional object. Now let's look at our friend uh, John Lennon here. And I, when we added a little more ink, Look at now, it sort of has its own space, right? But just by adding this section, it helped kind of capture the other side. It, it will look like that without it. It'd be a cool drawing. It'd be a great little sketch. Or just this side could be a really cool sketch. I mean, there's plenty of ways to, um, to take this. You know, you can leave it where it is. You can take it. You can tear it further. You can draw into it, you can put mylar over it, or which is a, a see-through see plastic. Um, but let's see, I, I will emphasize just a few more things here, just to kind of help define this image. And then I will, um, if there are any questions, I figured I might um, open up the, that a little bit to, to answer any of the questions you might have. Right, I, I I really like sketching with with um, just a, a brush and ink because it's so freeing, it's so loose. You can just move it around and things happen right away, um, which is why you know we saw those draw uh, drawings by Rembrandt. Uh, a lot of the major artists would often use and sketch with just a straight brush and ink which is sort of really counterintuitive. You, you, you would imagine that you would want to use something less committing. You know, it, uh, I, always thought of, I always thought of ink and brush drawing, sketching, kind of like, um, you know, answering a puzzle, a uh, word puzzle with a pen. It's kind of very optimistic. You're assuming you're making no mistakes, but that's the beauty of it. It means you're committing to your marks. And in a way, that's why they would use it because you commit, right? You can't erase ink. You can't erase that line. You can't, um, you may have to make it work, right? You, know, you put that, those lines here. If they don't work, they don't work. You learn something, but you kind of want to, to continue pushing your practice. You're just the desire to sketch. Now, I 
one uh, uh, one additional reasons why I personally have really gotten into it is because when when I try to plan a show um, or laying it out, it's it's hard to visualize. Like okay, yeah, so I have six paintings and I'm going to show, but how are they going to flow? Is there a continuation? But with sketching, you can quickly kind of lay it all down and sort of give yourself an idea what that how it all connects, if it connects, right? Um, another example, I have for years, I mean, I've got myself these tiny little notebooks. I like them because they look like little funny little passports and they just sort of fit in your pocket. Um, but they are full of all sorts of ideas and, and sort of from, from texts that go in there to different drawings. This is where my eyes got dilated and I couldn't see anything to just rubbing a, a, a pen on, on a paper, hoping something avert, emerges out of it to just frenzied lines, which I think this is when I went to see a, a show at Paramount to sometimes just, again, just nonsensical blobs, you know, just laying them and things, things come out of it, things emerge out of it, things come alive. And that's, that's the, 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 the thing about sketching that I love so much. There are no rules. You are bound by absolutely zero rules. There's a one I wanted to show you here, which is markers. Um, but anyways, I can't see it right now. I wanted to ask, are there perhaps any questions? I, nope. Um, so, okay, uh, I, I see. Can I ask a, one? Yes, absolutely, please do. So do you ever start with the composition like in that Lennon we were doing with, that, that was new to me to try with contrast and shading. Well, okay. I feel like my shading has a long way to go, but what, what something I try to do is start with like the broad shapes, like when you have the sure. arrow. Do, do you sometimes do your composition by kind of like the biggest shapes that you see and then kind of work sure. your way? Yes, and and often what I'll do, that that's, that's, a, uh, that's a great question. What I will do often is actually, again, I like to think in, in, in very broad, loose terms. So I often, it's, it's really funny, I tell my students, but I, I come up with these objects. So I might look at this big slice right here of this dark shadow and put that down first and say, oh, that looks like, you know, um, whatever, it looks like a, like a horn. And that, so I'll put just a, that big dark horn down and then move like that, right? And then start moving things around that object, um, and it and that can be very helpful. The other thing I would suggest is, particularly when it comes to doing either portraiture or and th there'll be a class coming on that, but either portraiture or using images from photo references or things that you are not obs observational from nature. What I always tell my students is. When you get started, so I'll, I'll jump that to that um, John Lennon for a second, is I'm looking at that John Lennon. And what often will happen is that we may look at it and people will start drawing. And let's say they'll begin with the top of the head, right? Because we start at the top. So we'll be like, okay, well, there's this nice little dip right there. So let me do that dip. Okay, there's the dip. And you, you put that, in and then you think, uh-huh, well, what's next? Well, there's this beautiful kind of shadow right here. Let's try to capture that shadow. And I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you're gonna see what, what will happen eventually, all right? By the time you get to the tip of the nose, you realize you ran out of room. It, it's not gonna fit on that page. And either I often see people, they'll start too high up and they will, the image will be this big and there'll be a ton of room left. Or on the other hand, they'll start too big. And by the time they get to like the nose or the upper lip, they run out of space. So what I suggest to do is to help you actually visualize what you're doing. And so take that page and before you even put a single mark on it, let's say it's a blank page, you wanna do that John Lennon right here. 
what I do is I always in a small corner, I will first draw a, I'll draw a rectangle or a square, whatever um, the surfaces that I'm referring to, my source material. And then inside that little square, I will actually fit in the object. In this case, it's portrait of John Lennon. So I'll just quickly in, in, put in a tiny little thumbnail that looks like this, right? And what this does, I guarantee you, it helps you visualize your surface in relationship to the original source that you're referring to. It's much easier now you've visualized it, not on a computer, not on a phone or whatever. It will be much easier to kind of try to fit it into the space that you actually have that's allotted to you, right? Um, but I often do start with just big, dark shapes and then work from big to small, right? From larger sort of undefined and precise shapes to much more sculpted. So think of it like having a big, piece of clay that is just round and you know you're starting to kind of define it and create little you know objects oh yeah there's there's going to be the holes for the eyes let's make a nose come out that's kind of what you're doing you're starting with a bigger shape and then reducing it you're you're, you're taking away some of that um some of that info so one of the things i um to to I wanted to, to, to say as things to remember is don't be too precious with your sketches, right? Uh, be willing to expand on them and be willing to, to mess things up. Um, and just if something, if, if a fancy strikes you to add, you know, wide out into it, go ahead and add wide out into it. Um, if it. If you feel like, oh, you know what? I originally had the drawing right there, but now I want to put marks down here because it's more exciting to me, do that. The, the key is not to be too precious with your drawings because it doesn't serve you any purpose. Uh, you are in control of the drawing. The drawing, the sketches should never be in control of you. And also the reason I say this is because I've often seen people get really then hung up on one element to say, oh, this is the best eye I've ever drawn in my life. I, I don't want to jeopardize it. So you start gearing your entire work to that eye when in fact it should be the other way around. Employ whatever technique is best suited to you and your work. Some people like to work big, some people like to work small, some people like to work fast, others like to take their time. There's no one way of doing this correctly. There, any way that works for you is the best way for you. Also, as I said, don't, work, don't, don't be afraid to experiment and accidents are absolutely great, okay? Let me show you. I had this beautiful piece of artist paper that I was saving for some inc incredible drawing I was gonna do because it's very expensive. And I put down a cup of coffee and it stained the paper, right? So this is a stain of coffee and I was kind of like, oh my gosh. And so I turned it into a drawing of our dog because it kind of looked like her. So accidents will give you things that you have never anticipated are possible. So don't be precious, let things come as they will. And the art making, there should be no pride in it, right? The pride is later when you're done with your work. Um, in play, um, use, I, I'm, I'm a great advocate of using whatever technological tools you wish to use. I am not one of those people that is like a purist and says, don't use digital. Digital is absolutely great to use, but do also continue practicing your traditional approach because there's something about doing digital that people get very quickly used to not having to innovate because uh, or, or not having to adapt to mistakes because there are no mistakes in digital. You see, simply hit undo. So even when I do, if I do um, some drawings, um, or images that will include digital uh, production in one point or another. For me, it always starts with a sketch. 
um, I may use just a sketch of, uh, uh, this is graphite on paper, then come over at ink. Now I might add colors into it, right? Digital colors in combination with actual physical colors. But you see, it all starts with that sketch because you can substitute the quality of line, the, the swelling of the line, the kind of the playfulness that it has. It just, I haven't found a tool yet that can do that. And the last thing to remember, uh, my advice to you would be always look, always observe, because when you start sketching, you start seeing world in a whole different way. You know, things, they just have more magic to them. You start thinking in terms of values and colors and shapes and 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 space and, and direction and things like that. So I always find things that just fascinate my interest. So again, I, I, I was going to to work uh, at uh, Seattle Central and I was used to take the light rail. Well, I saw this stain on one of the one of the escalator uh, steps, which totally looked to me like a face, right? So by the time I got to work, I just started playing around. This was on my phone with just a little editing tool. We just put a line. It looks like a face. Then you put a little pattern and end up looking like a little um, a Rembrandt drawing, but except done on an escalator. So that's that's uh, it for me with this. If you have any questions, I'd love to answer them for you. Yeah, we got a few in the chat. Thanks so much, Mia. Sure. Um, one of the ones earlier that I want to make sure we get to was from Inga, and she asked about what do you use for your whiteout technique? Do you just regular whiteout or do you have presentations? Good old fashioned whiteout. Cool. <laughs> Perfect. Um, actually, and if you want to get a little more um, fancy, you can get a, a, a five pack or 12 pack of these um, their gel pens. Um, the only problem with the, and, and they have a really nice little rolly tip. The only problem with it is that they, they tend, the tip tends to dry very quickly, uh, same as whiteout. So what you have to do is just keep, you know, wiping it off to get it rolling again. But yeah, this and this is my tool of choice and I carry it around everywhere. Wonderful. And then Eric asks, what questions do you ask yourself to guide your experiments with a sketch? Do you have any that opening is thought process? That, that's the, that's the, the big question. I always ask myself two things because sketching for me always leads to either painting or drawing, whatever. But my two questions are, the first question is always, what am I trying to say, right? What is, what am I, what is the intention of this specific drawing? Am I just doing it to be fun? Am I trying to, cap the, uh, am I trying to capture the likeness or is the likeness ins insignificant? I'm just going for exploring different mediums. So the first question for me is always, what am I trying to say with this image? What is my intention? And then two, who is my intended audience, right? Is this a sketch that will never see a light of day is just for me? In which case I, I go crazy. But if the intention is, well, perhaps this might be in a notebook or I could have others see it. Perhaps I might employ it in, a, in, in, in study or in, in lectures later on then that goes back to the first one. What are you trying to say with it, right? Um, so those are, to me, are those are the two questions that are part of my artistic philosophy. What am I trying to say? What's the intention and who is it for? Perfect. And Diane asks, she sees a lot of art sketches sold as prints. What do you use to digitalize them? That is a good question. Um, you want to be looking into Jacli prints. So um, G, uh, I-C-L-E-E, -E, I believe, if you just type in Jacli prints, um, it's a much higher resolution um, image and processing. So the, 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 the scans and, and the prints are uh, much purer, you know, depiction of the original. I personally don't do a lot of prints or uh, print a lot of prints of my own work and I'm not a printmaker at all. So um, I may not be the best source um, for that. But I would start by looking Jacli prints, and then that's that's your step. All right. Well, thank you so much. It looks like oh, those are pleasure. all of the questions. Oh, real quick, David just asked, what kind of sketch paper book are you using? OK, that is a, that's a great question, David. I have recently really began to almost exclusively use the Canson Mixed Media 
paper. And for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, that the heaviness of paper is really, a, uh, it's not extremely heavy, but it's heavy enough that I can put on there anything from um, acrylic to, to, you know, coffee that we were just using to um, even house paint. If you, if you use a, less, a, a lighter paper, it'll just rip through those pages. So this one, I think it's a 96 pound or 98. So uh, when it tells you the poundage, that means the heaviness of the paper. It has a tiny little bit of tooth. So there's a little bit of surface to it. So it's great for smudging. It's not too soft and too smooth, but yes, Canson mixed media. Um, it comes in nine by four, uh, nine by 11 and 11 by 14. Although those are harder to kind of come by. Um, just a great, a great little book. So that's what I use almost exclusively these days. And then it looks like Lauren's wondering potentially about the small pocket size book, the passport ones. Those I believe are by um, the brand is, uh, what are they called? Uh, it's in here somewhere. Um, oh yeah, here's a little notebook on it. Oh, never mind. Um, oh, it says right here, Mol Moleskin. That's right. And they come in three pack, right? That you, you get them and then three packets. I get the ones that are that don't have uh, that ha they're not lined, and half of the book is actually perforated. So if you need to rip out the pages, it's easier uh, than having to like completely destroy the booklet, um, which which is very helpful. Um, that is helpful. And <laughs> the, the surfaces are really wonderfully smooth and soft, and so it can take all sorts of 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 um, mediums that are applicable to this. I mean, I've used everything from ink pens to just even pencils themselves add a nice little uh, distinct uh, value in there. Markers, they're great to pay, to uh, glue on. So yeah, I, I, I can give you enough positive feedback on, on, these, on these little notebooks. They have been so wonderful. And I really would encourage to keep them um, because as artists, like you'll find that things, you know, even if it's doing something very silly, just like putting in patterns, like it's something to kind of keep your hand engaged, your hand, your mind engaged. It keeps your book full of, of information. And then when you're thinking about making something and you always get kind of caught in a moment thinking, well, I don't have, I don't have an idea right now to let me, I got to come up with something. That's when I just revert back to my notebooks and, you know. <laughs> I got ideas here to supply me for years. So yeah, these are great, great notebooks, really fantastic and easy to put away. Awesome. Well, it's fun to see some of what you've created in the past in them too. Thank you very well, much. thank you so much, everyone. Um, I know there were a few questions in there about other classes. I'll go ahead and send a, a message in the chat again. Um, for those, we've got two more coming up in the other months. We can work on having a double display for those who are um, total beginners. Uh, I know sometimes it can be helpful to follow along in that way. First and foremost, just thanks so much, Miha. Um, you're such My a wealth pleasure. of knowledge and inspiration. And, um, thank you for having me, everybody. All the kudos in the chat. People seem to have really really enjoyed this session. So with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time. Be safe, everyone. Bye.